A multinational team of archaeologists have discovered a preserved 2,000-year-old Roman ship in the sea off Sukasan off the coast of Croatia. The discovery was made by the International Center for Underwater Archaeology, which has been working in cooperation with the German Archaeological Institute and a multinational team. Underwater archaeologists first identified a possible wreck site back in 2021, after finding pieces of wood and coins that were minted during the reign of Emperor Constantine. This led to a full-scale underwater survey that has exposed 9 meters of the ship's hull, buried in layers of sand at a depth of 2 meters in the vicinity of the Roman port of Barber. The underwater ruins of Barber were first discovered in 1973, with ongoing surveys and aerial photographs revealing evidence of submerged structures and two piers, suggesting that the port was a major trading hub during the Roman period. Preliminary dating has suggested that the ship is around 2,000 years old from sometime during the 1st or 2nd century AD, during the first construction phase at Roman Barber. Samples of the hull has been sent to France for further analysis, in the hope that a more definitive date can be determined and to find out whether the construction material was local or came from other regions. Although parts of the ship have sustained damage due to shipworms, the entirely of the outer frame has been preserved and maintains its shape relatively intact. For the moment, the wreck will be buried in layers of sand, geotextile and stone to preserve the remains, but the team plans to return in 2023 to expose the remainder of the hull. Archaeologists from the Egyptian Dominican Archaeological Mission of the University of San Domingo have discovered a rock-cut tunnel beneath Tapaziris Magna, an ancient Egyptian city on the northern coast of Egypt near Alexandria. Tapasiris Magna was founded by Pharaoh Ptolemy II Philadelphus in the 3rd century BC, located on the navigable arm of the now dried out bed of the ancient Lake Mariotis. The city is named for a large temple complex, the Great Tomb of Osiris, which some academics speculate to be the final resting place of Cleopatra. The city served as a trading hub for handling products transported from across the lake, as well as receiving goods from overland trading routes before shipping them to Alexandria. It was also a major religious center for celebrating the festival of Koyak and the worship of Osiris, the god of fertility, agriculture, the afterlife, the dead, resurrection, life, and vegetation. During excavation works near the area of the Great Temple, archaeologists found a rock-cut tunnel that stretches for over 1,300 meters, at a depth of 13 meters beneath ground level. Initial studies suggest that the architectural design is similar to the Tunnel of Eupolinos in Samos, Greece, and that the Tapaziris Magna Tunnel dates from the Greco-Roman period of Egypt. Part of the tunnel is submerged underwater, but archaeologists have been able to uncover a number of ceramic vessels and pots buried in mud sediment, as well as a rectangular block of limestone. The tunnel discovery supports the theory that the foundations of the Tapaziris Magna Temple is also submerged in water which the team are currently in the early stages of conducting an archaeological investigation to understand the context of the monument. Previous excavations at the site have uncovered 2,000-year-old tombs, containing burials from the Greek and Roman periods with golden tongues, a stone head of Cleopatra, along with 22 coins bearing her image, gold leaf amulets, and a huge headless granite statue of a Ptolemaic king. The coffin of Tiamwea has been found in its underground burial chamber at Saqqara, and features in a TV documentary. It has lain within a burial chamber, undisturbed, for thousands of years. Now a remarkable Egyptian sarcophagus has emerged from deep beneath the sands near Cairo, to the excitement of archaeologists, who describe it as a hugely significant dream discovery. The giant granite sarcophagus is covered in inscriptions dedicated to Tiamwea, who headed the treasury of King Ramses II, Egypt's mightiest pharaoh. Ola L. Aguizi, emeritus professor of the Faculty of Archaeology at Cairo University, discovered it in Saqqara, an ancient necropolis about 20 miles south of Cairo. Last year, L. Aguizi, who heads the archaeological mission at the site, uncovered Tiamwea's surface-level tomb. Now she has found his underground burial chamber with the sarcophagus, which could reveal more about those who ruled Egypt after Tutankhamun. At the center of the tomb's courtyard, El Aguizi's team spotted the top of a vertical shaft, which suggested a passage to a burial chamber. But that shaft proved so deep, at 8 meters, that it took a week just to remove all the sand, using a bucket attached to a hand-operated rope winch. El Aguizi then squeezed herself into that bucket and made a dangerous, slow descent down the shaft. 
At the bottom, she was astonished to find the sarcophagus. National Geographic cameras captured everything while shooting the latest excavation season for an eight-part documentary series, Lost Treasures of Egypt, which begins in the UK on October 2. Finding a complete sarcophagus in its original tomb is incredibly rare. El Aguizi told The Observer, the discovery of this sarcophagus in its original place in the burial shaft was very exciting because it is the sarcophagus of the owner of the tomb, which is not always the case. Sometimes the sarcophagus is for a different person of a later period, when the tomb was used in later periods. But this time it is not the case. She said that Ta'amwiya's titles listed in the hieroglyphs emphasize his closeness to the king, proving that he had a very important role in the administration of that time. She added that the sarcophagus is inscribed with emblems of deities, including the sky goddess Nut on the lid, covering the chest with open wings to protect the deceased. Her team will now study it to uncover the full story of Ta'amwiya's life. Peter Dermanoulian, professor of Egyptology at Harvard University, said, Saqqara is one of the most important cemeteries for both royals and non-royals throughout the millennia of Egyptian history. This Egyptian team has added yet another important chapter to the history of the site. Oxford University Press is about to publish Manoulian's book Walking Among Pharaohs, George Reisner and the Dawn of Modern Egyptology, a biography of America's greatest archaeologist, who directed many excavations and realized the importance of Saqqara. Manoulian said of El Aguizi, I'm always pleased to see Egyptian archaeologists making these discoveries, there's a long history of Western archaeologists doing this work. So it's great to see their own discoveries, and the fact that she's a woman archaeologist, an Egyptian woman archaeologist, is even more welcome. Tom Cook, the documentary series producer, paid tribute to El Aguizi and her fabulous discovery, she's a grandmother, she's in her 70s and she's still going out there doing this really quite hazardous job. Noting that a piece of the lid had been broken off, indicating that ancient tomb robbers had stolen burial treasures, he said, these tombs, were, so frequently raided by tomb raiders that there was no guarantee that anything exciting would be down there. So it was only when they reached that final chamber that they realized something spectacular really was there. Egypt announced on March the discovery of five ancient tombs in Saqqara, marking the latest in a series of discoveries in the vast necropolis south of Cairo. The stony tombs date back to the Old Kingdom, 2700 to 2200 BC, and First Intermediate, 2181 to 2055 BC, Eras, Egypt's Antiquities Ministry said. They were excavated northeast of the Pyramid of Marenra, a 52.5 meters tall structure that was built during the 6th dynasty. The tombs, which are engraved with colorful shapes, belong to top officials, the ministry added. Mustafa el Wazari, the head of Egypt's Supreme Antiquities Council, said the first tomb belongs to an official named IRY. The tomb consists of a deep burial shaft leading to a chamber decorated with funerary scenes depicting offering tables, the seven oils and the facade of the palace. A limestone sarcophagus was also uncovered inside the tomb, he said in a statement. The second tomb belongs to a woman that could be the wife of a man named Yeret and it has a rectangular burial shaft while the third tomb belongs to Pepi Nephany, who was the supervisor of the great house, a priest, and the purifier of the house. It has a six meters deep burial shaft. El Wazari said the fourth, also a six meter deep burial shaft, belongs to a woman named Peti. She was the priest of Hathor, the goddess of fertility and love. The fifth is for a man named Henu, the overseer and the supervisor of the royal house. It consists of a rectangular 7 meters deep burial shaft, El Wazari added. More work and studies will be carried out to reveal more secrets of these tombs, he said. Egypt has carried out extensive digging operations in Saqqara in recent years, which resulted in a string of discoveries, including the unearthing of a 4,400-year-old tomb of royal priest Wadi in 2018 and the discovery of hundreds of mummified animals and statues a year later. Last year, Egypt unearthed 52 burial shafts in Saqqara with more than 50 wooden coffins found inside. They date back 3,000 years, the oldest sarcophagi found in the ancient burial ground. They also discovered the funerary temple of Queen Neret, the wife of King Teddy the first pharaoh of the 6th dynasty of Egypt. Egypt is hoping the discoveries, along with the expected opening of a new mega-museum near the Giza pyramids later this year, will revive its vital tourism industry.
As they work through the ruins of the Templo Mayor, archaeologists are on the verge of a massive discovery. This centuries-old complex once served as the primary place of worship for the Mexica people of the Aztec Empire, so it's hardly a surprise that they're about to find something interesting. However, this breakthrough could prove to be particularly significant, so much so, in fact, that the way we view this entire civilization could be forever altered. The Templo Mayor was built in the Aztec Empire's capital city of Tenochtitlan the ruins of which are today found in Mexico City. The place had been constructed in dedication to a pair of deities. These were Huitzilopochtli and Tlaloc, who were associated with war and agriculture respectively. The site upon which the Templo Mayor was built was a central part of Aztec mythology, and the building itself served as an important symbol within the people's belief system. As such, any new findings which could help to paint a picture of life in the empire are deeply significant. Certain aspects of the Aztec Empire and its workings remain shrouded in mystery today. Even so, a broad outline has been pieced together by historians over the years. The empire thrived from middle of the 14th century to the 16th century, encompassing the majority of the historical region of Mesoamerica's northern area. Historians consider the Aztec Empire to be the final major civilization of Mesoamerica. It was a society built on proficient agricultural and trading practices, but it also flourished through military action. Aztec soldiers prevailed over those of nearby states thus bringing the populace of these other places into the Aztec domain. The civilization can be traced back to the start of the 12th century, at a time when numerous city-states were dotted around what is today called Mexico. These realms fought one another for power and territory, and this ultimately led to a number of modestly sized empires emerging by the dawn of the 15th century. Among the most powerful of these empires were Texcoco and Azcapotzalco, who warred against one another in 1428. Texcoco emerged as the victor of this conflict, in part thanks to the help of a number of other cities. One of these was Tenochtitlan, which served as the Mexica people's capital. At the end of the war between Texcoco and Azcapotzalco, a new political coalition was created. This saw the victorious Texcoco, Tenochtitlan and another city-state called Tlacopan come together as one. This so-called Triple Alliance soon expanded, with Tenochtitlan becoming particularly significant. Over time, it ended up becoming the capital of the new Aztec Empire. Tenochtitlan ultimately became a great city, at one point considered to be the largest in the Americas, before the time of European colonization. By the beginning of the 16th century, it's believed Tenochtitlan was home no less than 200,000 people. This population, then, was split into a variety of different classes. At the ruling end were the Tatuptan, the leaders of Tenochtitlan. Below them were the Papiltan, the Masehualtan, the Mayak and the Tlacotan. We can think of these groups as having been the nobility, the common people, the peasants and finally the slaves. The Aztec class system was generally quite rigid, though a certain degree of social mobility among the poorer classes is thought possible. Tenochtitlan was a hub of trade, with a variety of products passing through the city. Examples of such commodities could range from precious stones and metals through to tools and weaponry. Food products were also popular for traders, with beans, grain and tortillas frequently changing hands. These too, were exchanged as food. The city exhibited a remarkable infrastructure for managing its water too. Canals cut through Tenochtitlan, with the city itself encircled by special plots of floating land known as chinampas. These chinampas were vital contributors to Tenochtitlan impressive agricultural output. On top of all this, the city also had structures to prevent flooding and man-made basins for drinking water. The city wasn't just a marvel in the more practical terms of trading and water management, however, many artworks were created there, and it was architecturally significant too. Perhaps the most impressive of all constructions in Tenochtitlan, though, was the Templo Mayor, the city's primary place of worship. Religion was important within the Aztec Empire. In fact, the city of Tenochtitlan itself was established for religious reasons. You see, Aztec legend has it that people deriving from a mythological realm called Aslan, eventually moved to the area around Tenochtitlan. These people had supposedly found their way under the guidance of the deity Huitzilopochtli. Huitzilopochtli is just one of numerous Aztec gods, along with Laloc. However, Huitzilopochtli was the most important within the culture. He was closely associated with the sun and war, while Tlaloc was aligned with rain, both deities had temples constructed in their honor at the Templo Mayor complex in Tenochtitlan. Aztec deities were celebrated through a variety of means. Festivals and feasts were organized, while acts such as the burying of special objects 
also took place. Sacrifices were also made to the gods, often in the form of animals. Yet human beings, too, were killed for religious purposes, with even children offered up to the gods. The Aztec Empire was vast, with a population of around 11 million individuals. So, given that it was so large, it's not surprising that it was often subject to revolts and conflict. These were usually dealt with easily, but in the early stages of the 16th century, things started to change. In 1515 the Aztecs suffered a defeat to their eastern neighbors the Tlaxcala and Huexitzingo on the battlefield. But then, matters got even worse. Soon after, the Spanish arrived on Aztec lands and attempted to conquer them. Beginning in 1519, the Spaniards fought the Aztecs for control of the territory and they didn't do so alone. In fact, they formed alliances with local Aztec adversaries. After three years of conflict, the Spaniards emerged as the victors on 13 August 1521. That was the day in which the European colonizers and their Tlaxcalan allies seized control of Tenochtitlan. This, ultimately, was the start of Spain's rule of central Mexican lands. Tenochtitlan had now become Mexico City. Before the Spaniards entered Aztec territory, the Templo Mayor was about 150 feet tall. Yet they soon started to dismantle the structure, making use of its stone in order to construct their own place of worship. This was the Metropolitan Cathedral of the Assumption of Mary, which still stands today. When the Spaniards dismantled the Templo Mayor, however, they may have missed something. You see, the temple they were stripping was just the latest iteration of the Templo Mayor. In fact, no less than six other variations existed, with different Aztec rulers having their own versions constructed over pre-existing ones. It was only at the beginning of the 1980s that contemporary archaeologists started to explore these older constructions. Among the initial discoveries made by archaeologists at Templo Mayor was a circular, carved stone, which was excavated in 1978. This dated back to the earlier days of the temple and it portrayed a female deity called Coilxaqui. According to Aztec legend, she was a goddess of the moon, a figure who was killed by her own brother Huitzilopochtli. At the center of the Templo Mayor complex, the remains of a variety of human body parts were also discovered. These skeletal remnants range from dismembered arms, legs and even skulls. This may indicate that the killing of Coilxaqui at the hands of her brother was replicated by Aztec worshippers. Starting in 1978 and concluding in 1982, archaeological works at Templo Mayor were headed up by one Eduardo Matas Moctezuma. These early investigations were fruitful, with numerous objects in addition to the circular Coilxaqui stone being uncovered. Undertakings during this period ultimately led to the establishment of an official scheme known as the Templo Mayor Project. Apparently, over 7,000 artifacts were uncovered from Templo Mayor as a result of these archaeological works. And there was a great degree of variety among these items. For instance, the skeletal remains of animals such as frogs, crocodiles and fish were found. But there were also objects like ceramics, knives, masks and gold. More recent excavations at Templo Mayor proved to be successful too. At the start of December 2015, for example, reports started to surface of a tunnel discovered in the site. This was a tight space which snaked toward a round platform and a pair of closed doors. Records from Spanish colonizers at the time of the Aztecs' fall stated that the native inhabitants of the land set the remains of their rulers alight after they died. They would do so upon a round platform known as a Cuoxicalco. As such, the archaeologists who recently discovered the tunnel and its own Cuoxicalco hope that they'll eventually find the resting place of Aztec kings. The head of these archaeological undertakings is Leonardo Lopez Luyan who spoke about the tunnel. According to The Guardian in 2015, Lopez Luyan said, Once we freed the passage from earth and stone, we knew it led directly into the heart of the Cuoxicalco. At the end appear two old entrances sealed up with masonry. According to reports, this passageway is actually a part of a larger tunnel which was found back in 2013. During this initial excavation, a container was uncovered within the passageway, hidden away behind a large stone. Inside lay golden artifacts, stone-carved knives and the skeletal remains of humans and birds. Some of the human remains inside the container belonged to miners who were between 5 and 7 years old. The fact that knives had also been found indicates that the children may actually have been offered up as sacrifices. This, of course, wasn't all that unusual within Aztec culture. Lopez Luyan elaborated on the potential significance of the platform that he and his team happened upon. From what the sources say, the Cuoxicalco was a structure of a funerary character he said. So, we can speculate that behind these walls, there might be two small rooms that contain the incinerated remains of several leaders. As for who these rulers may have been, Lopez Luyan has his ideas. According to the archaeologist, 
it's possible that Moctezuma I was laid to rest in this part of Templo Mayor, along with his heirs Xaxacatl and Tizoc. These three men were in power across the 14th and 15th centuries. If it turned out that the tunnel discovered by Lopez Luyan and his colleagues really did lead to the remains of Aztec rulers, it would be hugely significant. You see, the practices that were undertaken in the aftermath of an Aztec ruler's death are still unknown. So, this discovery could potentially shed light on the subject. Rosemary Joyce is a professor from the University of California, Berkeley. Noting that the resting places of Aztec rulers has proven elusive to experts, she also spoke about the works going on to find such places. As she put it, archaeologists keep digging down, hoping they're going to find the big guy, but they're running out of places to look in Tenochtitlan. Joyce did reference the fact that discoveries have been made which have alluded to the practices undertaken in the aftermath of a ruler's death. Artworks depicting such kings bundled up in cloth, seated upright, with little crowns on have been found. And drawings of cremations have also been uncovered, but nobody knows where the actual ashes would have been deposited. Certain details inside the recently discovered passageway do indicate that Aztec rulers might be close by. In fact, the two doorways inside the tunnel could actually reflect the governmental structure of the civilization. That is, they might represent the emperor who was known as the Tlatoni, and a second person referred to as the Sihuacatl. It's possible that the Aztecs may not have actually buried the ashes of their dead. Having said that, as Rosemary Joyce pointed out, perhaps the special status of rulers changed matters. It may well have led people to lay king's ashes to rest inside the Templo Mayor. Joyce suggested that the early leaders of the Aztec Empire, may have been particularly celebrated. In this way, a comparison could be made to the way that Americans idolize their first leaders, like George Washington. As she put it in 2015, Washington is not then President Barack Obama's great-great-great-grandfather, but he is the father of the nation. In addition to Joyce, another expert from the University of Florida stated how unclear it is if the Aztecs buried the ashes of their leaders. Speaking to AP, Susan Gillespie said, it is not surprising that these cremains have not yet been found or identified. Archaeologists don't quite know what they're looking for. For the time being, conclusions have yet to be reached on the matter. Indeed, shortly after the tunnel and Cuauhtacalco were found in 2015, lead archaeologist Lopez Luyan encouraged people to be patient. Answers would come down the line, but works such as this take time. Hopefully, though, we'll soon learn if rulers were laid to rest in this grand temple. U.S. and Iraqi archaeologists working to reconstruct the site have unearthed extraordinary 2,700-year-old rock carvings among the ruins. They include eight finely made marble bas-relief carvings depicting war scenes from the rule of the Assyrian kings in the ancient city of Nineveh, a local Iraqi official said Wednesday. Discovered last week, the detailed carvings show a soldier drawing back a bow in preparation to fire an arrow, as well as finely chiseled vine leaves and palms. The grey stone carvings date to the rule of King Sennacherib, in power from 705 to 681 BC, according to a statement from the Iraqi Council of Antiquities and Heritage. Sennacherib was responsible for expanding Nineveh as the Assyrians' imperial capital and largest city siding on a major crossroads between the Mediterranean and the Iranian plateau including constructing a magnificent palace. Fidel Mohammed Khodr, head of the Iraqi archaeological team working to restore the site, said the carvings were likely taken from Sennacherib's palace and used as construction material for the gate. We believe that these carvings were moved from the palace of Sennacherib and reused by the grandson of the king to renovate the gate of Mashki and to enlarge the guardroom, Khodr said. When they were used in the gate, the area of the carvings poking out above ground was erased. Only the part buried underground has retained its carvings, Coder added. Alif, the Swiss-based International Alliance for the Protection of Heritage in Conflict Areas, said the Moshki Gate had been an exceptional building. IS targeted the fortified gate, which had been restored in the 1970s, because it was an iconic part of Mosul's skyline, a symbol of the city's long history, it added. Alif is supporting the reconstruction of the Mashki Gate by a team of archaeologists from Iraq's Mosul University alongside U.S. experts from the University of Pennsylvania. The restoration project, which is being carried out in collaboration with Iraqi antiquities authorities, aims to turn the damaged monument into an educational center on Nineveh's history. Iraq was the birthplace of some of the world's earliest cities. It was also home to Sumerians and Babylonians, and to among humankind's first examples of writing. But in the past decades, Iraq has been the target of artifact smuggling. 
Looters decimated the country's ancient past, including after the 2003 US-led invasion. A small farmer in the Opava region in the northeast of Czechia made a unique discovery while working in a field, unearthing a golden belt dating back to the Bronze Age. The ornamented piece, which is exceptionally well-preserved, should go on display at the Bruntel Museum at the end of next year. The golden belt had been lying underground for thousands of years before being unearthed by a farmer while he was harvesting beetroots. The founder, who wishes to remain in anonymity, discovered the ancient piece of apparel at the end of September and immediately contacted archaeologists from the Silesian Museum in Opava. Yuri Juchalka, head of the museum's archaeology department, says that as soon as he saw a photo of the item, he knew it was something exceptional. The first hypothesis was that the thin golden sheet of metal, which is around 50 centimeters long, was a tiara. However, after examining the object in greater detail, experts now believe it was actually part of a belt. It is decorated with raised concentric circles and topped with rose-shaped clasps at the ends. We realized that it was too long to fit on someone's head. So we actually think it is not a tiara, but something much rarer, a part of a belt. Belts at the time were made of leather and this was strapped to its front part. It was crumpled when the finder found it, probably as a result of agricultural activity, so it is a miracle it has been so well preserved. It may be missing a few tiny parts, but otherwise it is in perfect condition. The thin metal sheet is made mostly of gold, along with some silver and traces of copper and iron. A preliminary analysis places its origin around 14th century BC, says Teresa Alex Kilnarova, conservator at the Museum of Bruntel. It is estimated to be from the Middle to the Late Bronze Age, but it is only a preliminary determination based on the decoration. Similar decorative ornaments appear in more than one prehistoric cultures and therefore a more detailed research and analysis of the metal is needed. It probably belonged to someone in a high position in society, because items of such value were rarely produced at the time. That's why we are talking about someone more esteemed. While the monetary value of the belt is yet to be determined, it is already clear that the object has an incalculable cultural and historical value, says Ms. Kilnarova. Such objects are rarely found even during excavations, so it is a really unique discovery, not only in our region, but all over Czechia. I think it is safe to say that it will be one of the most valuable objects that we'll have on display in our museum. The rare item, which will become part of the Museum of Bruntel Collections, will now be thoroughly examined and conserved, before going on display for the public. Hello and welcome to Blast World Mysteries. Please subscribe. Italian authorities on Tuesday announced the extraordinary discovery of more than 2,000-year-old bronze statues in an ancient Tuscan thermal spring and said the find will rewrite history about the transition from the Etruscan civilization to the Roman Empire. The discovery in the San Cicino de Bagni archaeological dig near Siena is one of the most significant ever in the Mediterranean and certainly the most important since the 1972 underwater discovery of the famed Rias bronze warriors, said Massimo Asana, the culture ministry's director of museums. Thanks to the mud that protected them, the figurines were found in a perfect state of conservation. Alongside the figures were 5,000 coins in gold, silver and bronze, the ministry said. As evidence of the importance of the find, the ministry announced the construction of a new museum in the area to house the antiquities. Jacopo Tabali, who coordinated the dig for the University for Foreigners in Siena, said the discovery was significant because it sheds new light on the end of the Etruscan civilization and the expansion of the Roman Empire between the 2nd and 1st centuries BC. The period was marked by wars and conflicts across what is today's Tuscany, Umbria and Lazio regions, and yet, the bronze statues show evidence that Etruscan and Roman families prayed together to deities in the sacred sanctuary of the Thermal Springs. The statues bear both Etruscan and Latin inscriptions. While there were social and civil wars being fought outside the sanctuary inside the sanctuary, the great elite Etruscan and Roman families prayed together in a context of peace, surrounded by conflict to Bali said. This possibility to rewrite the relationship and dialectic between the Etruscan and Romans is an exceptional opportunity. Some of the two dozen bronzes are entire figures of humans or gods, while others are of individual body parts and organs, which would have been offered up to the gods for intervention for medical cures via the thermal waters, the ministry said in a statement.
Archaeologists from the Austrian Academy of Sciences have uncovered an early Byzantine business and gastronomy district at ancient Ephesos, located in the Izmir province of Turkey. Ephesos was built in the 10th century BC on the site of the former Arzawan capital by Attic and Ionian Greek colonists. During the Classical Greek era, it was one of 12 cities that were members of the Ionian League, emerging as a major urban center with monumental buildings that included the Library of Celsus and a theater capable of holding 24,000 spectators. The city was also famous as a sacred place for pilgrims visiting the nearby Temple of Artemis, which has been designated one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Ephesus, as part of the Kingdom of Pergamon, became a subject of the Roman Republic in 129 BC after the revolt of Eumenes III was suppressed. During the 1st century BC, the city entered an era of prosperity under Roman rule, becoming both the seat of the governor and a major center of commerce. According to the Greek philosopher and historian, Strabo, it was second in importance and size only to Rome. During recent excavations, archaeologists have discovered an early Byzantine business and gastronomy district on Domitian Square, a prominent public place directly adjacent to the political center of the Roman city, the Upper Agora. Byzantine shops and workshops were built over a large Roman square complex, with the team focusing excavations on a structure consisting of several business premises that covers an area of around 170 square meters. Individual rooms are preserved up to 3.4 meters high, containing thousands of pieces of ceramics, including whole bowls with the remains of seafood such as cockles or oysters, as well as amphorae filled with salted mackerel. Also found were stones from peaches, almonds and olives, and also charred peas and legumes. The team also uncovered four gold coins, solidi, in addition to over 700 copper coins. Archaeologists suggest that the excavated rooms functioned as a cookshop, a storeroom, a workshop, a taberna, and a shop for lamps and pilgrim souvenirs, indicated by the discovery of around 600 small pilgrim bottles that were sold to Christian pilgrims. The destruction layer is likely the result of conflict, with several arrowheads and spearheads also being excavated that the team links to the byzantine sasanian War of AD 602-628, a series of wars fought between the Byzantine Empire and the Sasanian Empire of Iran that left both empires crippled. Swedish maritime archaeologists have discovered the long-lost sister vessel of the 17th-century warship Vesa, which sank on its maiden voyage, the Swedish Museum of Rex has said. Launched in 1629, Applet, the Apple, was built by the same shipbuilder as the famed 69-meter Vesa, which is now on display in Stockholm after being salvaged in the 1960s. Our pulses raced when we saw how similar the wreck was to Vesa, said Jim Hansen, maritime archaeologist at the museum. The huge shipwreck was discovered in December 2021 in a strait off the island of Vaxholm just outside the capital, Stockholm, according to the museum. Mr. Hansen said the construction and the dimensions seemed very familiar to them, sparking hope it could be one of Vesa's sister ships. While parts of the ship's sides had fallen off, the hull was preserved up to the lower gun deck, and the parts that had fallen off showed gun ports on two levels. A more thorough survey of the wreck was carried out in the spring of 2022 which revealed ship details that had previously only been seen on the Vesa. The museum said technical details as well as measurements and wood samples confirmed that it was indeed Applet, Vesa's sister ship. In 2019, the same museum reported the discovery of two other warships in the same area. Archaeologists at the time believed that one of them could have been Applet, but further investigations showed that those vessels instead were two medium-sized warships from 1648 named Apollo and Maria. With Applet, we can add another key piece of the puzzle in the development of Swedish shipbuilding, Mr. Hansen said, adding that this enabled researchers to study the differences between Applet and Vesa. This will help us understand how the large warships evolved, from the unstable Vesa to seaworthy behemoths that could control the Baltic Sea a decisive factor in Sweden's emergence as a great power in the 1600s, Patrick Hoagland, another maritime archaeologist at the museum, said. Named after one of Sweden's kings, Vesa was originally meant to serve as a symbol of Sweden's military might but instead capsized after sailing just over 1,000 meters. It was salvaged in 1961 and is currently on display at the Vesa Museum in Stockholm, one of Sweden's most popular tourist spots. According to the museum, the designer of both ships, Hein Jacobsen, realized that Vesa's proportions could lead to instability even before she was launched and therefore built Applet wider than her ill-fated sister. 
In late 1658 the ship was no longer deemed seaworthy and was sunk the following year at Vaxholm. Two other ships were also ordered from the same shipwright, Cronin, the Crown, and Scepter, and like Applet they also served in the Swedish Navy and participated in naval battles. The ships are believed to have been sunk on purpose after they were decommissioned. Researchers from the National Institute of Anthropology and History, INAH, and the Bajo Labyrinto Archaeological Project have conducted a LIDAR survey of the Maya archaeological zone of Kalakmal, revealing the extent of urban expansion that lies beneath the jungle canopy. Kalakmal is located deep in the jungles of the Greater Petén Basin region in the Mexican state of Campeche. The city was the capital of what has been named the Kingdom of the Snake, indicated by the extensive distribution of a snakehead glyphs known as Khan. Throughout the Classic period, Kalakmal maintained an intense rivalry with the major polity of Tikal to the south. At its height in the late Classic period, it is estimated that the city had a population of 50,000 inhabitants and covered an area of over 70 square kilometers. Inner researchers, working in collaboration with the National Center for Airborne Laser Mapping at the University of Houston, Texas, and the Aerotechnologia Digital SA de CV, conducted an aerial LIDAR survey over an area of 95 square kilometers within the Calakmal Biosphere Reserve. Light detection and ranging, LIDAR, is a method of remote sensing using light in the form of a pulse laser to measure ranges, variable distances, to the Earth. The differences in the laser return times and measuring the wavelengths can be used to compile a 3D digital map of the landscape, removing obscuring features such as tree canopies that could hide archaeological features. The results revealed the dense urban sprawl and residential apartment complexes, consisting of 60 individual structures grouped around temples, sanctuaries, and possible plazas or markets used for trade and commerce. The density of structures and construction works to support the city inhabitants, suggests that around AD 700, Calakmal was one of the largest cities in the Americas. Reporting on the survey, an INAH representative told reporters during a broadcast on INA TV, the magnitude of the landscape modification may have equaled the scale of the urban population, since all the available land was covered with canals, terraces, walls and dams, to provide maximum food security and sufficient water for the inhabitants of the city.